So welcome everybody. I'm uh, Alessandro and I'm here with my friend and colleague Iker. For the next hour, we'll be here to answer your questions about the last blog post in the series of blog posts about list interoperability solution. The title of the blog post is cross-chain uh, message in a bottle. Um, please, before we start, let us know in the chat if the audio and video are working fine. And in the meanwhile, um, we we'll wait. We we'll wait, I guess. For the okay. Maybe we should uh, speak though to make sure that the audio is working. Otherwise, well, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> a sunny day in Berlin. Well, well, it's a sunny afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Let me rain a bit <laughs> in the morning. Um, so there are some deep construction going on next to next to the this center. So. <laughs> and uh, just just a reminder, you can cast your questions either uh, directly in the YouTube chat or on Discord. We will try to catch them all and uh, answer them live. Um, I think uh, audio good. and videos are working fine. Okay. Yeah, so well, before starting with the questions as they are, I think uh, it will be good, Alessandro, the author of this last talk post, uh, a message in a, in a bottle. Can you summarize, give uh, what was the the main content of, of the blog post? Sure. So um, in the last blog post, I focused on the cross-chain messages. And uh, in a sense, the best way to understand cross-chain messages is actually to draw a comparison with transactions. So uh, a transaction mm -hmm. is just uh, something, uh, you know, an object containing a command and uh, this command is something that triggers a state transition in a blockchain. So um, in this sense, a cross-chain message is analogous to a transaction because it's an envelope for a cross-chain command, which will trigger a state transition in a blockchain. The main difference here is that while a command uh, triggers the state transition in the same blockchain in which the transaction was included, the cross-chain command will instead trigger the state transition in a different chain. Um, so um, moving forward further with this uh, analogy, uh, the main properties of a cross-chain message are very similar to the properties of a transaction. Also for a cross-chain message, we have, uh, for example, a fee property, which in this case is the message fee. We have a nonce property, which is uh, the nonce of the sending chain. So it's uh, just an identifier identifying how many messages have been sent from the sending chain. Um, on top of these properties, we have the sending and receiving chain IDs, which identify the sending chain and the receiving chain of the cross-chain message. Um, and we have the parameters property, right, where the specific um, details of the cross-chain command are contained. Cross-chain command is identified, again, by some command ID and the module ID, the module to which the command belongs. So these are the main properties of a cross-chain uh, message and the interoperability model already comes with some pre-packed cross-chain messages that are used to facilitate interoperability in this ecosystem but we do uh, basically uh, use the paradigm of custom cross-chain commands in the same way in which we use this paradigm for custom commands uh, for developers to implement actually the custom logic that run on their, uh, on their blockchain applications so this is more or less, uh, uh, you know, an overview of the blog post. Um, maybe we can uh, move on already with some uh, questions. So the first one at this point will be for you, Iker. Um, so in the blog post, uh, we discuss these uh, pre-packed cross-chain messages that are part of interoperability. And in particular, there are show them the channel terminated message and the sidechain terminated message. So maybe uh, 
the names are quite similar, so it could mm -hmm. be a bit confusing. But can you summarize again what are the differences and the purpose of these two cross-chain messages? Yeah, because um, yes, you said like the 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 name can be a bit confusing or like we can miss mix each other. But um, the the first one, the the one with the channel in in its name, the channel intermediate message, is to inform a, a, a sidechain that was terminated, like on the main chain, when um, in normally, or in most of the cases, because of a break in the liveness uh, requirement, the, the sidechain may be terminated. And <clears throat> the sidechain is somehow informed with this message, with this channel terminated message that it was terminated, or at least the channel that was connect, connecting to main chain is terminated from this moment on. And also in this in this channel that is sorry in this message that is somehow saying okay until here our relationship right with the main chain you are already out of the uh, Lisk ecosystem. Uh, in that message we also put the the um, until which message uh, the the main chain was processing. So the mm -hmm. the side chain will know okay now I am already out of the Lisk ecosystem mm -hmm. and I know that. Uh, the main chain or the ecosystem processed until this message from 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 me, and and that's it. From that moment on, the sidechain with that information can, if they want, they can uh, continue as a standalone block. So that would be some sidechain protocol that is triggered only on the sidechain if they want to do something. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, from that moment on, yeah, it's totally up to the the sidechain protocol or whatever it is defined there, because mm -hmm. yeah, here the what is defining the interoperability protocol or, or a module is, okay, this message is, is triggered, you have this information, and that's it. Now we de terminate the channel. And uh, that's for the, the first one. The second one, the um, site and terminated message, is uh, from the other point of view, from the point of view of other sites that they want to communicate, they want to send course messages to, to this site and that was terminated, uh, this message plays, plays a role here. So. Um, when a sidechain working uh, as expected uh, sends a message, a cross chain message to this sidechain that was terminated, uh, this, when this, um, um, for example, this uh, arbitrary cross chain message uh, reaches the outbox of this terminated uh, sidechain, this uh, message will be crea created and uh, sent back to the original sidechain sending this, this me message. Basically, to to say to tell this working sighting that look, you are sending messages to a sighting that is terminated, and and yeah, you should be aware that this sighting is terminated. This anything that you send from now on is is not going is not going to have any effect. Um, so that's the main role to to tell other sightings when they are trying to communicate with this terminated sighting to say, okay, uh, please, uh, this other sighting is terminated. Um, don't send more messages. Also, the, um, the other role that are attached to this message is to, to send back the, um, the state, the last certified state of this terminated sidechain, send it back to, the, to this uh, sending sidechain. So we, and this will be the, the focus on, on, other, on other blog posts, in a future blog post, we will trigger this uh, recovery mechanism, a state, in this case, a state recovery mechanism, to like do users who had something in in this other terminated sidechain, they can uh, yeah start this recovery process to to recover whatever they they had there. So that's probably the the yeah the description of these two messages. One is the ch the channel one is to say the terminated sidechain, hey, you are terminated, uh, goodbye. And the the other one, the sidechain terminated uh, message is to say to tell other sidechains that. You are trying to com uh, communicate with a terminated site. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Uh, very nice explanation. So maybe the next one is on me. So let's see. Uh, for example, are fees of CCMs, so of cross-chain messages, always paid uh, with the LISC token? Who gets these fees? And is there a minimum fee like for normal transactions? So the question here is about the fee of the cross-chain message, the fee property there. So to answer it immediately, yes, these fees are always paid in LISC because uh, LISC, uh, the LISC token, is basically the global currency of the ecosystem. 
And uh, since all cross-chain messages are routed via the main chain, we are allowed in the main chain to keep track of the movement of these list tokens that are used to pay the fees. And uh, these fees are not assigned to the uh, block generator that includes the cross-chain update containing the cross-chain messages with these fees into a block, but they are assigned to the relayer. And the relayer is actually the user that prepared and sent the cross-chain update. So um, basically, the idea here, the rationale, is to use these fees as an incentive for users to prepare the cross-chain update containing these cross-chain messages and to post it either on the main chain or on the side chain. Because in this way, they would get this message fee back as a compensation, partly to cover the cost that they have to incur to actually post the cross-chain update. Because remember, the cross-chain update is just a normal transaction, as and as any transaction has to pay fees. Now, uh, as for the last question, is there a minimum fee like for normal transactions? No, there is no minimum fee for cross-chain messages. And uh, there is something that is similar to a minimum fee that we use to um, that we use only for sidechain to sidechain communication to guarantee that if there are some basic interoperability error, like uh, maybe the receiving chain actually does not support the cross-chain message that we're trying to process coming from the sending chain, if the sending chain paid this minimum fee, then automatically this message is sent back to the sending chain so that maybe it can be uh, processed back. So you can imagine this like you're trying to send some mail to someone and uh, you don't find the address. I don't know if that's the best example or they're not home. I don't know. And uh, if you pay the, some small tax, then you're guaranteed to get your mail back. Otherwise, the mail is just discarded and that's it. And also, um, maybe to add to the last point, um, indeed, there is no we can say that there is no minimum fee as per the standard interoperability protocol, right? Like there is no impose any minimum fee as on the contrary happened with the normal transactions. But um, any custom module, they can specify uh, some kind of a, a fee, right? Like if uh, there is a custom module that has uh, some cross-chain functionality or cross-chain commands, cross-chain CCMs, well, uh, cross-chain messages, um, they can say, okay, um, a cross-chain message for this custom module, they have to set at least this fee or they have to set this exact fee or something like that for this to be accepted in the in the receiving chain, right? They can be, um, as you also point out in the, in the blog post, there can be this custom error handling saying, okay, um, for my custom module, this cross-chain message is not paying the required fee and I, or ignore it or send it back. So, they can be like a um, whole, let's say, a specific fee system depending on the custom module that uh, is how it is specified. But yeah, uh, the main point here is that for the standard interoperability and how it works, there is no no uh, a requirement of, of fee. Absolutely. Uh, good point, which actually uh, connects back to the next question that now you can answer. So um, someone is asking, why do we need sidechain error handling when we do have a main chain routing and main chain error handling? Yeah, it's somehow uh, partially uh, explain the reason there. Um, yes, we have, uh, well, this main chain routing, just to reiterate that it's clear, is that um, in our interoperability solution, right, the least main chain uh, is somehow, I think as, as you said in the blog post, or somewhere else, then we have this star configuration, right? That the least main chain is in the middle and every other side chain is communicating through the main chain. They can communicate with any other side chain, but always passing through the, the main chain. That's what we call main chain routing. And yeah, you can say, okay, uh, there is an error handling uh, of course in messages for main chain and every message has to pass through the main chain. Then why do you need to do anything, any error handling uh, for side chains? Um, so the idea here is like, Main chain, yes, we do main chain routing. Everything, every message has to pass through the main chain, but they are not processed as per the logic that they imply in, in the main chain, right? They, they are just somehow forwarded from one inbox to, from the inbox of the sending uh, sidechain to the outbox of the receiving sidechain. Uh, so the main chain is just forwarding those messages. This means that 
the mainstream doesn't have knowledge of the, exa the, the specific logic, custom logic and, and processing that should happen um, respect to these cross chain messages, for example. And it's in, in particular, uh, it can, the mainstream doesn't know which modules are um, like the, supported in the receiving section, right? And a typical uh, error that can only be exploited or can only be handled in, in the sidechain is the, the error that, okay, in my sidechain, I don't support this module. You are sending me a cross message with an unsupported module. I, I just uh, send it back saying, sorry, I cannot process it. But yeah, this knowledge of which module my sidechain supports, the mainstream that doesn't have. So that's, that's, for example, a typical example of the, um, of the, of the sidechain error handling. But this can be much more complex. It can be totally, um, um, yeah, arbitrary error handling for, for the custom module, as complex as the custom module want to make it. And also, I think we have, uh, yeah, there are thousands of uh, possible no, integers to, to be assigned <laughs> to, to, to error handling. So it can be a very complex. You can have many errors. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, that's the main idea. So. Uh, there are certain, even though we have mention routing, this doesn't mean that the mention knows what's going on with the message. At least uh, beyond that, okay, I cannot uh, I cannot send this message this message because the sidechain is uh, terminated. So beyond that, everything else has to happen in right. the in the sidechain. And, and this is part of uh, why we believe that this solution allow us to scale, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the main chain role, especially in in a, in, a, in processing a block and processing custom messages is always limited unless the mention is directly involved, right? So yeah. for the sidechain to sidechain communication, the mention role is just that of a yeah. group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, next question from Agisbart, maybe uh, on Discord. So um, the question is, is it possible to scale uh, an app with sidechains to achieve a thousand transactions per second and how theoretically it could look like? For example, can sidechains being in sync, one with another, communicating and performing part of network load? Is it doable when interoperability is live, or would it require additional leaps and additional modules? Um, okay, so we connect again to this point of scalability, scalability, right? So in a sense, our solution wants to solve this problem of uh, increasing the number of transactions per second. Each uh, sidechain in the ecosystem is like a, a separate state machine, right? So it, it will you know, define a separate state, separate state transitions that can run independently. And in this sense, the number of transactions per second scales with the number of connected sidechains in the whole ecosystem because each sidechain can you know, process independently from each other uh, and move on independently from each other. Um, and of course, this goes beyond you know, the, the paradigm of every, having everything happening on the same chain in a centralized place. Well, centralized quotation mark. Because uh, if you have only one chain where you're processing transactions, then of course you're limited by the block size, more or less divided by the block time, right? And you, you're hitting some hard constraints there due to you know, just network constraints, basically. And to propagate blocks fast enough at the end. So, in this sense, if I understand your question, we already uh, you know, address this problem of uh, increasing the number of transactions per second. On the other hand, when you say um, sidechains being in sync one with another, maybe what you mean is uh, having these sidechains uh, being more uh, part, uh, shards of, the single state of a single state machine. Like they share the same state. Like uh, let's take a simple example of, uh, uh, I don't know, balance uh, ledger and uh, they want to process in parallel many transactions well in this case you do need something more complex right because in general um, if you if you want to run them independently from each other you need some more complex protocol for example just to agree later on on what is the shared state of this collection of sidechains so you could do something similar to optimistic rollups, for example, in this case, or in general, something more complex that allows you to actually scale in this way. Um, is it doable when interoperability is live? Well, yes and no, in the sense that, you know, with a 
Lisk SDK, you are very free to implement what you want. I don't think this is necessarily too difficult to implement, but it's certainly something that we do not uh, like provide out of the box right now. Um, I don't think it's going to be necessarily in the next research goals to research something like uh, a sharded uh, machine or something like that. But it's definitely something that could be uh, useful if you have uh, some application that really requires a super high transaction per second. In that case, uh, you know, you have to sit down uh, at, uh, at your computer and start hacking. And then once you have that, you can connect it with the standard interoperability protocol to the main chain. And maybe you can provide some sort of layer two where a lot of transactions are happening very quickly and then you connect back i don't know a lot of possibilities there i think yeah and i would say like if the main purpose of of this is just to have a well as high throughput as possible like the, the highest mm, number of tps or terms of transactions per second i would say that um yeah yeah as you said first it's like the developer will be totally free to do whatever they, they want with the sdk um and probably this idea of having then side chains interconnected or in sync, whatever that means, is maybe not, at least for me, will be not the first natural approach, right? Like, uh, as you were saying at the beginning, maybe the first natural approach is to see what is the limit or how high we can go in a single side, uh, side chain, try to um, make it as lightweight as possible and and maybe also with some specific custom logic to have, for example, super small um, transactions, like trying to, uh, I mean, they will be like similar to uh, token transfer, but uh, like somehow skipping some some properties and some fields. So uh, at least in my first, if I am fa facing this problem, I will go trying to go in that direction and see, okay, how far I am now after having this unique site chain super lightweight site and how far I am from my goal of 1000, for example. And then from then on, there's like, okay, maybe I need something more complex or or I am okay with this. Or um, yeah, as you were saying also, like I can even have some kind of a second layer um, solution from this unique site. And so, yeah, I mean, there are so many, many possibilities, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think the general idea is once that you have uh, the interoperability um, outside released and the SDK 6.0, uh, all these ca uh, these things can be, well, uh, this is the kind of thing that will be uh, super like awesome to see people trying this and, and going beyond whatever we thought in our uh, uh, tests and, and so on, so yeah. It's kind of at least the having this kind of um, questions going to that right direction. Nice. More, more questions. So there is one from uh, Ultrafresh and uh, from the YouTube chat. Ultrafresh. So uh, are there details about locking disk into a side chain and will disk have a native bridging mechanism? So um, yeah, I guess uh, locking disk into a side chain means moving your LSK tokens from the main chain to the side chain. And the native bridging mechanism, I guess it refers to this uh, uh, transfer. Um, yes, no. I mean, yeah, maybe if we are answering the wrong way, I understand in the same way, right? Locking Lisk into a sidechain is basically sending your Lisk funds to, to the sidechain, right? And this is probably one of the, well, out of the box kind of function like this, right? The, with the token module, we have all this um, scrolling kind of scrolling logic, right? That the, um, um, well, not only for the list token, but in a specific for the list token on main chain, when you are sending sending some kind of uh, a token transfer to, to another side chain, then this list that you are uh, sending there are going to be, there is an accountability, right? Of, of which tokens are going to the side chain, which tokens are to the side chain. So they are somehow locked in this scrolling account that um, um, is defined by the by the token module. 
and the, maybe just once we're even directly from the user perspective, moving Lisk to a sidechain will be basically as easy as moving Lisk to another account, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You will just have a transaction that instead of specifying just the receiving address, you also specify the receiving chain. And as Zipper was mentioning, then it's just a matter of keeping track of where the funds are. Keeping in mind that uh, once the funds reach a sidechain, then the main chain does not keep track of the owner, just of the sum overall owners. Like you trace out basically, and you keep just a single account for the whole sidechain. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just a security mechanism to to make sure that if the sidechain goes wrong, goes rogue, and they try to to pretend that they receive more list funds, the main chain can notice this. And uh, you know, the maliciousness of this sidechain is contained within the sidechain and does not propagate in the rest of the network. So if a sidechain goes rogue, that's it, it you know, will be terminated. And uh, well, if uh, the main chain notices that, for instance, they try to uh, extract more risk that, uh, that the, the amount of risk that was escrowed, but then there is no risk for the funds of users in other chains in the ecosystem, basically. Mm -hmm. And also, um, well, I mean, this for sure the main chain will notice as soon as the the sidechain tries to like take out or send out more tokens that it had in this scroll account. Yeah. This will be not. Other thing is like, who are the owners of these tokens that happen in the the sidechain and the the main chain doesn't keep track of that. And the the other thing I wanted to add. Uh, just uh, as a general note is that this is going to be um, the the topic of the next blog post, right? I think Maxim is going to write the next the next blog post for the token module, the interoperable token module. Yeah. So these kind of things should be covered there, like how um, not only for the list token, for but for any token that is defined in the list ecosystem, any fungible token that is defined in the ecosystem, how it is uh, all these questions are taken care of and and how um, everything should be consistent with respect to native sidechains, native tokens, and, and so on. Yeah, definitely a very interesting topic in the next blog post. Regarding uh, the second question from so uh, a native bridging mechanism, mm. um, how do we understand this? Uh, I mean, if I understand the native bridging mechanism is um i will call okay there are two ways we can understand this uh probably the naive one is native bridging mechanism in the ecosystem yes it's in the operability module right that's the bridge bridging mechanism with all, all the other side chains but if we are asking about the uh, native bridging mechanism as in with other um blockchains not uh not following the the, the least interoperability solution i mean Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. Um, in that case, is uh, does the I think we, as we said, right in the um, list JS. This is one of the or the main I would say the main research objective and the main objective in general for the last um, uh, how is the the name diamond phase of the the diamond phase <laughs> of the of the list roadmap. So in the diamond phase, the apart from other things, but at least for research, our main objective will be to to define this bridging mechanism with a, well, at least we have some candidates at the moment, of course, to have a bridge with Ethereum, with uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I remember like we mentioned, I think in the last AMA or before, uh, uh, Polkadot, Cardano, Cosmos. But yeah, I mean, this is, not um, uh, coming now with the, the this interoperability solution as as what we are now we have already specified, but this is the one of the main things or the main thing coming in a near future mm -hmm. for this diamond phase. Um, there is another question from YouTube, which probably will uh, generate a lot of interest. So. If sidechains can have their own token, because as Iker mentioned, in the LISC SDK, we will have this token module and sidechains can define their own custom tokens. How will the LISC um, utility and the LISC, LISC token 
price benefit. Um, I don't know, I can try to answer this and you can add something. Mm -hmm. So again, LISC will be necessarily used as the common currency in the ecosystem. If you want to participate in interoperability, if you want to remain connected, your sidechain has to post at least one cross-chain update per month. We put this rather large time, rather loose time constraint but in, in reality, if you want to have your sidechain be considered updated, probably you know the rate for these cross-chain updates must be much higher. And uh, these cross-chain updates on the main chain will be just main chain transactions. So they will have to be, uh, the fee will have to be paid in LISC. As I mentioned previously, the message fee for cross-chain message will always be in LISC. And in general, the utility of the LISC token will be, again, this common currency. Since uh, you need the LISC to pay message fees, probably you will need the LISC in a sidechain. You will need to move some LISC tokens to the sidechain. And, uh, you know, as an extra step, not every sidechain has to define their own custom tokens if they don't want to. Or maybe they would define a utility token, a governance token, but maybe they still want to keep the LISC as the fee like internal normal transaction fee for the sidechain. As after all, LISC is probably, you know, the token that everybody will accept uh, gladly, right? So, um, well, yeah, uh, I think, as you said, the main the main point is that this token is going to be like, yeah, the, the, the oil, the gas, <laughs> gas uh, to, that makes the whole Leaks ecosystem work because without spending using Leaks, there is no cross-chain communication uh, at all. I think that's that's by itself the, the, the main proposition. Then also, as you were saying in the second one, uh, I think one of the big use cases for maybe not, um, let's say like more humble, smaller projects, uh, they will probably start as a proof of authority um blockchains right because they are okay i mean they, they don't need to have um, like a, such a big uh, base of uh, of block validators and they are okay with a semi centralized solution and so on or at least in the starting ages they can do that and if in most of the cases a proof of authority um, um blockchain doesn't or don't they don't need to define any any reward token or anything like that. So it's probably the natural um, choice for the, all these projects with proof of authority blockchains and smaller projects will be to just use the least, uh, least token for, first because of adoption, right? Because already it's easier for them. And also because they don't need to define any governance or reward token. So I think that's going to be in, in many cases, the, the situation using LISC as a as the, the, the main token of, of the blockchain, right? Naturally. Um, but yeah, I think once again, the, the for me, the most important part of, of adding, um, let's say, giving the actual utility to the list token is this um, needed uh, component for every crossing message or every crossing update to, to happen because they have to spend uh, the fee in, in the list token. Yeah. And also, I mean, there is always this, I mean, uh, let's be honest, double side to the price, right? If uh, the price goes up, everybody holding LISC is happy. And on the other end, you could end up in a situation like Ethereum, where you have to pay $25 to make, make a transaction, although very simple. So, you know, it's uh, always something to keep in mind. I would say, but of course we could have a high price and very low transaction fees since uh, the minimum fees are very low right now with the new dynamic fee system. So uh, next couple of questions are actually quite uh, pragmatic, quite uh, implementation oriented questions. So the first one is uh, from, oh, they're both from uh, Apoor Gupta actually on YouTube. The, the first one is about uh, um, Elixir. Uh, so Elixir, if I'm not mistaken is, uh, Erlang, basically, <laughs> implementation. 
So uh, have you ever worked for any Elixir blockchains for custom messages? I mean, a blockchain startup as a developer working on layer zero chain based on Elixir. So here I understand it as implemented in Elixir. Have you worked for custom messages for Elixir? I'm not sure I understand this question. So what we do uh, with Lips is basically specifying the protocols, which are basically the general abstract rules that you know participants to the LISC ecosystem have to respect in order you know, to agree on the correct state transitions and so on. So you could implement these rules in any way you want. LISC SDK is written in Node, as you probably know, meaning that it's just a specific implementation of the LISC protocol, but you could uh, implement the LISC protocol in any language. We have no plan to do so anytime soon. Of course, using a functional uh, programming language as its benefits, so something like Erlang, Elixir, why not? Could be a good idea. So give it a try. I mean, it would be great if somebody yeah. uh, opens a fork, honestly, and gives gives us a different, uh, a new implementation of Lisk protocol in a different uh, language. Would be cool. And uh, the second question is similar in the sense: Is Flutter and Dart good for building cross-chain wallets? So. I Not 100 percent sure, but I think also these are like uh, you know uh, frameworks for yeah Flutter maybe is for Flutter, Node or I think I heard that one no it's uh, Google yeah on software but and Dart uh, the same so I mean again uh, anything is good if you're familiar with it you should go for it we decided to keep our stack simple we do everything in Node.js in the Lisk repository because we believe this is an advantage because, you know, Node is the, I don't want to say something stupid, but I think it's one of the, it's probably the most spoken, uh, you know, programming language mm -hmm. because uh, the fact that you can use it now for both for backend and frontend, you know, gives a strong advantage in this sense. So again, if you're familiar with Flutter and Dart, go for it. Absolutely. I would say, um, I mean, Apart from <laughs> the answer from Alessandro, I think this this question, especially like at least from my side, it gets me totally an uh, offside as football. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would say, I mean, if you you bring this question to to Discord uh, to our dev channel, um, and through one of our guys in user interface, they they will have a better um, better answer. Also, like how to use different tools with our code base uh, in, in particular for front end and so on. So for, I would say like you can go uh, discord, just post this question and, and yeah, these guys in in front end and UX that they have much better knowledge yeah. than us on this. I'm sure they will say something. For sure. Interesting. So uh, when you say when we talked about tokens that user had on a terminated side chain, do we assume there is a custom module persistently uh, living on the sidechain, which is handling all, all the locking and token escrow logic for the terminated sidechain? Uh, so if I understand, again, this correctly, I mean, it's not a custom module. The token module already basically contains the logic, the token and interoperability module together contains the logic by which you can recover token since we're talking about terminated sidechain, I think yeah. we're talking about recoveries here that uh, are that are, are locked, are stuck in a terminated sidechain. Because what is the problem here? If you have some tokens, LSK tokens, on a terminated sidechain, you cannot take them out, right? Because once the sidechain is terminated, you cannot send uh, cross-chain messages from the sidechain back to the main chain. But using the last certified state route on the main chain, you can give a proof that you add a certain balance in the side chain, and then the main chain and the token module will uh, will process this proof and uh, give you back your funds on the main chain. This is not a custom module, which this is something that comes out of the box with the LISC SDK. It's part of the interoperability protocol, and uh, again, it just works. And uh, it's even, I, I would argue, relatively simple from the protocol point of view. It's just something that we can do, and we do. Yeah, and just to give a, uh, a bit of more. Uh context is, as we said, uh, will be the, the, the magic of the smart market trees, right? That's why this can happen. I mean, because 
if you see this without uh, knowing what's going on, it's like, okay, well, how do you, can you recover something from sidechain or whatever, this data structure that maybe is already offline. And so uh, actually all the information that you require to recover those tokens are is already given on, on main chain with the, the state rule, right? That's the, and, and what Alessandro said is proof, yeah, it's a, we are thinking about this sparse medical tree on the top, you have the, the root and you are like showing how to compute this proof, uh, sorry, this root from from one of the of the leaves, right? That's the... They, they say Italians use their hands a lot. <laughs> Spanish people are not, uh, you know. Well, it's a medical tree, I mean, nothing, I, nothing I had to, to, I had to, to invite. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's how we we design this, right? Like it's a sparse Merkle tree behind uh, all these roots and information that is kept kept in the in the sidechain account on mainchain, and with that, you can recover well in this case tokens easily with the with this information. Yeah. No. And we have a blog post coming up for that. Ah, yeah. Yes. So. Um, Okay, we have uh, maybe this question is interesting actually. How does uh, this work from the SDK point of view? So since we were talking about the SDK, so here meaning uh, how do you actually create custom cross-chain messages in your blockchain application, right? Um, so maybe I can take a stab at this one. Um, basically, the LISC SDK provides automatically um, the network layer, the consensus layer, and part of the state machine in the sense that um, our state machine is organized in modules, which are basically uh, compartments for separate protocol logic. There are some modules that come out of the box, like a block uh, uh, generator selection mechanism. We, you can select depots or proof of authority and so on. You have the token module that comes out of the box that allows you to create custom tokens, interoperability module that allows you to connect to the ecosystem and so on. And then of course, you know, the important part is the custom modules. So the modules that developers uh, write to actually implement some custom logic into their blockchain application. Now modules communicate with each other via uh, APIs, which are basically uh, functional calls that you can do from one module to another to actually trigger a state transition from a module um, a state transition that is actually relative to another module. So uh, just to give an example, if you want to vote for someone in Depos, you would cast a vote command, right? But then to lock the tokens that are used to actually vote for the delegate, you call an API from the token module and ask a token, please, uh, token module, please lock these tokens for this user and so on. So we use this paradigm also for interoperability. In your custom, module you will write a custom command custom store and whatever you need for your dap logic and then uh, in the custom command can just call an api from the interoperability module to actually generate a cross chain message which will be then uh, you know uh, automatically added to the outbox of the main chain and and uh, all the necessary steps to actually send it send it to the receiving chain are done automatically. So from the user perspective, you just send a normal transaction that then generates this cross chain message that eventually is included in the receiving chain with a cross chain update. So no difference then from casting a normal transaction. From the developer's point of view, you basically have to add this logic to call the interoperability module, but all the intricacies of the proofs, Merkle trees, sparse Merkle trees, whatever, everything is automatically handled behind the curtains of the interoperability module. And we, we use the same uh, uh, method also for errors, right? So going back to sidechain error handling, if you want to, to create some custom error handling, you just call the error API for interoperability module, and this will take care of everything, like sending back the message with the error status and so on. And um, the recovery, right? Like uh, for recoveries, Custom modules they can define a their specific way to recover what what a custom module understands for a, being recovered uh, from the terminated sidechain. Like uh, for example, in the token module, it's easy to understand that being recovered means like bringing back the balance from the terminated sidechain to right. to the other sidechain. But for a uh, custom modules, 
it can be a, any kind of logic, right? So they have to also define what will be in the case of um, um, something being like part of this custom module or the, the uh, future having something in the other terminated site and how, what will mean to recover this back to the original site and so. Yeah. So basically these processes are streamlined on one end, but also very flexible on the other because mm -hmm. you can define, I mean, you have a freedom to define whatever custom, you know, processing also for this recovery you want. Um, there's another question by Apor, really likes Erlang, I must say. So if I connect a layer zero Erlang-based blockchain, which again, I understand this to be like a blockchain written in Erlang, which could be following any protocol. You could even write Ethereum in, in Erlang if you really wanted. Uh, can I actually connect this blockchain to Ethereum using Lisk? So maybe to answer this question, I would ask you to forget about Erlang and just tell us if you can connect a layer zero blockchain to Ethereum using Lisk. You can go wide, I guess. <laughs> connect a layer zero, so, when you mean layer zero blockchain? You mean I mean, they just mean just a blockchain, base, an independent blockchain. Yeah, base blockchain, right? Yeah. Um, Using Lisk, correct? Yes, I mean, I would say, I think this is going to be one of our main. I mean, probably now I cannot give the proper answer, but in some months probably I can elaborate. You, the... You're, it's like a trailer, <laughs> like an appetizer. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, basically that, uh, in my understanding, both this question and how you made it. Uh, is like basically creating a bridge to, to Ethereum, right? Uh, mm -hmm. From from Lisk, and well, from Lisk ecosystem because uh, that's the thing. Like we are assuming here that the Lisk main chain has uh, this already settled functionality, but there are going to be a certain side chain or group of side chains that they have this bridging uh, functionality, and and yeah, I mean, first of all, we already mentioned that this will be our focusing the our research team uh, focus in the next months but also i think once again with the sdk mm, in the current version and and in the version with the interoperability already need i think developers can already start i don't know i would say there is nothing stopping for a developer the right to start like okay what is the what is the requirements from bo both ends from from ethereum side and from uh, the LISC SDK or the LISC uh, sidechain side. And yeah, I will say it's not going to be a simple or the most simple thing to do, but but yeah, I mean, I would love to see people starting to uh, right. brainstorm about that. So if we brainstorm about that, as you said, like uh, probably on one side, you would have like a LISC sidechain or something. Mm -hmm. So something that understands and follows the LISC protocol, at least in regard with the inter with regards of interoperability. And then, of course, you must define some custom protocol. And then on the Ethereum side, you could have a smart contract or something. Yeah. And you could have uh, calls from anywhere in the ecosystem to this bridge uh, sidechain. Then that communicates with Ethereum. Again, maybe with a contract call, something like that. And then the other way back, yeah, something that you can do if you understand the Ethereum protocol on this side chain. Yeah, I mean, exactly like uh, basically this side chain will be the bridge, right? Uh, yeah. It can be just this unique functionality. This side chain is doing the bridge, so getting all the CCMs from other side chains that they want to send something to Ethereum or to whatever other blockchain. Yeah. And yeah, that will be that will be a way of at least starting to think about that. Right, and the advantage here would be that again. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I don't want to say scalability, maybe it's the wrong word, but at least currently in terms of uh, uh, functionalities, uh, having a lot of transactions on Ethereum is costly. Yeah. While uh, in this sidechain, you could have some, as part of the protocol, some, uh, you know, something in place to make the transactions cheap. Mm -hmm. So um, there is one question now from Tom Plum, Andrew. Could LISC become deflationary when we would have X amount of sidechains with X amount of daily transac transactions? Uh, would be an interesting calculation to do. Oh. Mm, maybe, 
I mean, I don't know if I understand completely, but just to clarify, so we're on the same page. LISC tokens are uh, created as reward only on main chain, right? So if you if you generate a block on a side chain, you don't get a reward in LISC because, uh, of course, this would go against the paradigm of having this escrowed account and the main chain, and in general, the native chain of a token, the main chain is the native chain of the LISC token, um, being able to, to actually control and keep track of every token in the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So LISC tokens are only generated on main chain with the usual schedule, one LISC token per block as a reward, if you behave. <laughs> so in that sense, if you don't get proof of misbehavior, yeah. I guess. So in that sense, uh, the, the inflationary schedule does not change uh, at all with interoperability. Now, uh, I don't know if you can interpret deflationary yeah. as being yeah, the think... price compared to USD. I don't know. No, I would say it's, uh, or at least how I understand it, you explained the, the, the first part of, of the, the answer, I would say, that is LISC interoperability is not going to make LISC more inflationary, only same or less, right? Because um, you have already this uh, on main chain, this idea of burning the minimum part of the fee. Yeah. And with side chains, uh, this can only, well, for many reasons. First, uh, more transactions happening on main chain. This will imply uh, the burning rate increasing. At the moment, if the, and that's, I think, in the in the leap, the fee system leap, leap 14 or 13, I think uh, it's already somehow estimated. If you have all the, the the blocks full for the the rest of the time, it's still uh, it's not deflationary. Still, you you are increasing much less, like eighty percent less or something like that. But it's still, you are increasing in a very slow. You have a really small inflation, but still you have an inflation. So in terms of if we keep the block uh, size constant and and only considering the least uh, mention it is uh, still a little bit inflationary. Assuming that LISC interoperability implies that every block is going to be full, all the CCUs and everything. But then it can be that other sites, they have some kind of uh, whatever, like random functionality. We cannot stop other sites to burn or to lock the uh, LISC tokens. And, and in that regard, I would say that if um, first, the main chain is busy with transactions, so a lot of fees are, are burned for, uh, per every block. And certain sidechains are using the list token, for example, proof of authority sidechains, and, and they have some kind of minimum fee or, or something like that. I think easily the list token can be deflationary, like whatever started at the beginning of the year in total supply is less than... Yeah, exactly. That's what you mean here by deflationary, like uh, the... the... The supply of list tokens is decreasing. Yeah. Right? Here, I, I guess here what they mean by deflationary is that the price uh, decreases, like inflationary in the terms deflationary in the terms of, you know, uh, price decreasing against, uh, you know, a fiat currency like uh, price of bread decreasing. I guess, mm -hmm. which uh, again I don't think that that is what is going to happen if you have sidechain. I think for what you said actually for the same reason, exactly the opposite should happen, right? Because list will be in demand for. You know, more uses, message fees, CCMs, even just internal functionalities of a sidechain and so on. Yeah, so, well, yeah, it can be deflationary in terms of like what you understand now yeah. with the euros, right? The inflation means the one euro, the value of one euro is less. But if you take, take into total, total supply for least token, yeah, it's so, yeah, I mean, they both are somehow very much correlated. But, but yeah, I would say, I, I think. In general, like to, to see, well, at, at least uh, the, the total supply part that we can control, I think it's also an interesting thing to check, right? That um, assuming that the least maintenance is totally busy and other sites are doing this or that, um, when we will have a, mm -hmm. a total supply that decreases in, in time. Um. We have any any new question? So right now there are no more questions currently, and we're almost done. 
So uh, maybe we can wait a couple of minutes to see. Oh, yeah, there is the last question, I would say. Oh, it's just a clarification, I think, from Tom. Ah, yes, yeah. So he was thinking that the burning rate could be higher than the rewards. So yeah, basically oh, that's what you said, the yeah. total supply, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, to clarify, um, in principle, the only by protocol, the only uh, blockchain that is burning uh, LISC is is the LISC. Well, yeah, it's basically what I said before, right? This is the LISC uh, main chain. And as I said before, even if all the blocks with the current block size are uh, full, there is still a bit of increasing in the supply, but I think it's such a minor increase in the supply that as soon as other side chains start using the list token, and when I say using in any way, right, it can be used just because this side chain is list token to function, um, to pay the fees in the, as soon as this happened, the, yeah, the total supply, maybe uh, we cannot, we cannot say that this other list in other side chains is being burned because it's just maybe being locked or being, I don't know, kept uh, out of reach in some kind of logic. But, but yeah, like easily, the, at least the available LISC supply can very easily decrease as soon as there are many sidechains. Like, mm -hmm. So more sidechains will never increase the supply. It will or keep it uh, as it is or lower it down. And very likely, at least how I see it, will, um, yeah, decrease it because it's going to risk, uh, just risk in some kind of uh, a way at the end of the day. Very clear. Um, I think that with that, can conclude. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's almost uh, 5, no, 5 p.m. Yeah. There are no more questions. We um, yeah. thank each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess, uh, uh, also thank you for all the questions. <laughs> Um, I hope uh, it clarifies some, some concepts. Um, I think it was also some some interesting discussion here. And then the next one, as I think uh, we said, it was the token module, yeah, interoperable fungible token module, which would be a nice one for sure. Like yeah. a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. And uh, as always, if you have more questions, just go to Discord. You know, there are several channels. If you have a, you know, very programming related question, our devs super happy and super good in answering them. Protocol questions. You can also go to the research forum. Yeah. And uh, that's it. A lot of lips are being merged right now. So if you're interested, you have plenty yeah. <laughs> of reading to do. And uh, we thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And Bye. till the next one. <laughs>